So Jesus just left the temple, and the disciples are like, oh, well, look at this place. And he says, you know, this, all these things, this temple is going to be thrown down. And then the disciples in verse 3, they ask him a question. And this is really important because it's a two-part question. They say, tell us, when will these things be, his refer- the reference to the destruction of the temple, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So that's either a two or a three-part question. When will these things be? He's referring, that's referring to the destruction of the temple, what Jesus just mentioned. That happens, we know, in 70 AD. The Romans destroy the temple. So somehow this chapter is answering a question that is resolved in 70 AD. But they also throw in, and what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? So that's either one thing or that's two things. The question is, your coming? Well, is that like Daniel 7 coming on the clouds, which is exaltation? Or is that coming as in like a return? But we know the end of the age, that's looking far greater. So their question is, when's the temple going to be destroyed and when's the end of the age? Has the end of the age happened yet? No, we're still here 2,000 years later. So somehow Matthew 24 answers by saying the same thing. It answers these two different questions that are separated by over 2,000 years. So that's one of the ways apocalyptic literature works. When we get to that section that uh, was questioned about in verse 40, I'm going to start in verse 36. But concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. For as were the days of Noah, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day when Noah entered the ark, and they were unaware until the flood came and swept them all away. So will it be at the coming of the Son of Man. So in the days of Noah, do you want to be uh, taken away or do you want to be in the ark? You want to be in the ark. Okay, let's keep looking at the next example. Verse 40. Then, in that time, the return of the Son of Man, it would seem, then two men will be in the field. One will be taken, one left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken, and one will be left. Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known when what, known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So he's compared it to the days of Noah. Those who are swept away by the flood, who are taken away by the flood, are the ones who suffer judgment. But those who are remaining in the ark and are on the earth afterwards, those are the righteous ones. So in verse 40 and 41, he says, there are two. One is taken, one is left. You don't want to be taken. You want to be the one that's left behind. You want to be the one that's left behind. If you don't believe me, look down at verse uh, 50 and 51. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he does not know. And will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Cut up and put with the hypocrites. Taken away. Um, the common, the really popular books, the Left Behind series, uh, that is not riffing off of this text. I think uh, they, they've taken their interpretations from other passages, but not this one. As far as what Jesus is saying here, like he would be saying, you don't want to be taken, you want to be left behind in this text. Hmm. That's a lot. That's confusing. Okay, because I always read that as the rapture, but obviously it's not. Yeah, this is, this is, this is not a text on the rapture. So even though it kind of sounds like, like it, because of the popularity of the Left Behind series, it's totally not. And if we, you just read it over and over again, you're like, oh yeah, the days of Noah, you don't want to be swept away with the flood. You don't want to be taken away. You want to be left. <laughs> Yeah. Context, 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 context. yep. Yeah. All right, any other questions on Matthew?
Okay, then I'm going to show you some things. We're going to talk about Matthew uh, 16, a little bit of 17, a little bit of 18. Go to Matthew 16. Matthew is the only gospel that has the word church show up in it out of the four gospels. Is church important to Christians? Yes, it is. And Jesus speaks about church. So we're going to start in, in Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? I mean, Jesus loves calling himself the Son of Man. And that is a reference to Daniel 7. If we haven't gotten good at knowing that is Daniel 7, tattoo it on your forehead. Daniel 7, Son of Man. Very important. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they, they said, well, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? This is is Peter's gold star moment. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Remember Christ, the Christ, that's a Greek translation of the Hebrew word Messiah, Mashiach. It means anointed one. Remember, all throughout the Old Testament, we are waiting for the anointed one. So Mashiach in Hebrew means anointed one. Christos in Greek means anointed one. We are just transliterating them into English. So that's why we have the term Messiah and Christ. But they're titles, not names. You are the anointed one, the son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you. Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter. So he's getting getting a little nickname, getting renamed. His name is Simon, but Jesus here is renaming him with the nickname Petros. You are Petros. You are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. This is the text. uh, So this is the first text in Matthew that mentions church there in verse 18. But this is also the text that Roman Catholics will point to in argument for the papacy. So their, their view of the papacy is that the papacy is a direct lineage of the authority of Peter. That Peter was the first pope having authority over the church. Um, in the Roman Catholic view, the final authority is not scripture, but the final authorities are scripture and the church. And because the keys to the kingdom of heaven were given to Peter and not to scripture, It's actually the church's authority that trumps scripture. So that's why sometimes throughout history there have been councils in the Roman Catholic, uh, Vatican councils in the Roman Catholic Church that have actually gone against scripture. But they see that as no issue because it is the papacy that has final authority. So they see the papacy as being a descended lineage, spiritual lineage from Peter. Yeah. Wouldn't their claim be that? Yeah. Say, yeah, 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 yeah. Scripture says X, we say Y, and we're writing scripture's wrong. Yeah, the, but, and the way they would frame it is that the church, um, specifically the papacy, is the one with authority to interpret scripture. Not that scripture in, informs how we live, but rather the church interprets scripture, and then you have to appeal to that interpretation. Yeah. Uh, and the, so the way they get that is, is one of their arguments is here in verse 18. You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, Peter, Petros, means rock. You probably know this. You probably have learned this at some point. It's like a play on words where he names Peter. He gives him this nickname. You are rock, and on this rock I will build my church. Sounds awesome, right? And it sounds like it's hard to argue against the papacy idea, yeah? 
except for there's a big glaring error in their interpretation. It's really simple if you can see it in Greek. So when it comes to language, this was written in Greek. When it comes to language, uh, if you're talking about something in a sentence using um, some sort of like demonstrative pronoun or something along those lines, which would be like this or these, it's going to agree in gender and number. So language has gender. If you've learned any like romance languages, you know that uh, language has gender. So if when, when Jesus says, and on this rock, I will build my church, if that were referring to Peter, it would agree in gender and in number. Petros, Peter, is in the masculine singular. But the word for rock is in the feminine singular. So yes, it is a play on words, but it is not saying that the rock is Peter. It is not equating the rock that the church is built on to Peter himself because they disagree grammatically. So right there, simple grammatics show that this is not talking about Peter. So the question then is, what is it talking about? What is the rock that the church will be built on? Now there is a play on words happening between Peter and and the rock, and even when we get to Acts 2, like the first one who gives the big Pentecost sermon that establishes the church in the new age is Peter. But Peter is not the foundation of the church. So what is? Maybe on this rock refers to Jesus. That is a possibility. What would the other possibility be? There's one other possibility. Huh? And how are you getting the word out of this? Well, it's got to be something in the immediate context of the passage. Yeah, there we go. The claim that Peter just made. Peter just said, he made this confessional statement. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, good job, Peter. On this rock, I will build my church. The foundation is the confessional statement that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of the living God. That is what the church is built on. Nothing else. So there's lots of quote unquote churches in town that deny that Jesus is the Messiah or deny that he is the son of the living God in some way deny this. Now they might have church in their name, but they're not a church. They're not a church that Jesus is building, at least. They're a church that they are building. So the church, which which means gathering, referring to God's people, the gathering is built on the confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Yeah? Okay, yeah. Then it says, oh, who, who builds the church? Who builds the church? Jesus builds the church. Jesus builds the church. And how is he building the church? On the confession that Jesus is the Messiah. So what should churches talk about all the time? That he's the Messiah. He's the son of the living God. They should talk about who Jesus is and what he has done because that is the only way the church will be built and it's the only way that Jesus says he will build his church. Is on this rock. Yeah. This is not a disagreement with you, but he does, like in the next passage, go and tell all his disciples, oh, by the way, don't tell anyone. It's true. So that's that's such a weird thing. Yeah, yeah. But there will become a point where he does tell them to to tell people, yeah. Uh, So not only will he build... His church on this confession that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. But notice that it says, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now you might think that that means that hell won't be able to attack and defeat the church. But where are gates located? Entrances. So who's attacking who? The church is attacking hell. The gates of hell will not be able to withstand the assault of the church. So the church is a, a, an active warrior in this divine program that we call human history. 
attacking the gates of hell, and the gates of hell will not be able to prevail against it. Then we get this interesting line that's also going to show up in Matthew 18, the other section that the term church appears. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Weird grammar. There's two verbs happening right here. Um, it's... So there's a future and then a perfect passive. Don't worry about what those mean. But if a little bit more wooden, it'd be whatever you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. In other words, what you do on earth is a, it's affirming a reality that's already true in heaven. So it's not that the church has this power to make heavenly realities become true, but rather they affirm heavenly realities. All right, so those are very, very different. And that's another spot that we would disagree with Roman Catholics. But again, grammatically, it's already have, has it been bound in heaven, but it will have been. So then the question is, well, the keys, keys to the kingdom of heaven, like what do you usually have keys for? What do keys mean? Um, so I heard, okay, I heard lock. I heard authority. I heard Unlock. Uh, unlock. Okay. Uh, what do you use doors for? Security, safety. Security and entrance. Oh, the keys to the kingdom. So perhaps entrance mm-hmm. into the kingdom. How does someone enter into the kingdom of heaven? Jesus. Through the gospel of reality. Yeah, that confession that they just were given. Yeah. The way you enter into the kingdom of heaven is through repenting and believing in Jesus. That he is the Messiah, the son of the living God. So there is the keys to entering in, and the keys have been handed over, at least here, to Peter. Like Peter has those keys in his hand because he just made that confession. Now, that's how you enter the reality of the kingdom of heaven, but how do you express that on earth? How do you express that heavenly reality here on earth? Well, does uh, just saying that you believe does that express it on earth? Being a church, baptism, baptism, being a member of a local church as the heavenly outpost, belonging to a gathered assembly is how you like you visibly show that you're a part of this kingdom, heavenly kingdom reality. Um, so, the keys then, not only entrance and exit and protection, right? You, want, you don't want just anybody coming into your home. So the keys to actually enter in is the gospel reality, but it's also letting people in and keeping people out. Keep letting people in and keeping people out of what? Why would there be a distinction, a divide? Where is that even happening? The local church. It's the, lo- the reality of the local church. Not everyone who shows up on a Sunday is a believer. And we wouldn't even say that everyone who comes here on a Sunday, I wouldn't even be so confident to say that everyone here is a believer. And it would be wrong of Brett on a Sunday or me in here to say, everyone is a believer. Unless I knew confidently. Unless we knew confidently. So that's part of the, this reality of having, having the keys. And that's why some things are you bind on earth as has been bound in heaven. Some things you loose on earth as has been loosed in heaven. Sometimes you let go of some things to reflect realities. Okay, now turn to Matthew 18, because we're going to see that phrase and the expression church show up again. We're going to start in verse 15 of Matthew 18. And we're going to see the word church, and we're going to see that expression of bound on earth and loosed on earth. If your brother or sister, if your brother or sister sins against you, go and tell him his fault. Okay, pause. Are we talking about, like, genetic siblings? No. 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 What does that term usually mean in the New Testament? Believer. Yeah, another believer. Uh, uh, So another Christian has sinned against you. 
So if your fellow Christian has sinned against you, go and tell him or her their fault between you and them alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. What would it mean for you to tell someone they've sinned against you and then for them to listen to you? What does that actually mean? Okay, I believed, acknowledge, hear. they hear, they understand, repent. they repent. Oh. Yeah, that's, I mean, it's not just like, I understand the sentence you just articulated. You know, that's, that's like, well, that's not what it really means, right? There's a little bit more to it. It's, it's that they not only hear the accusation and believe it and recognize it and, and, and own it, but they repent of it. Yeah, I, you're, like, you're right, I did sin against you. I Will you forgive me? Boom, that's a victory. That's awesome. You've gained your brother or your sister back. You've gained them. But if they don't listen, if they do not listen, maybe you've gone to them multiple times and they just continue to not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three Witnesses. So you bring one or two friends uh, with you, uh, uh, also people in the church. Uh, that way there's some accountability that you really have brought this, this accusation against them and that there really is some accountability that they're, in, in how they're responding to the situation. But then that doesn't seem to work. Verse 17, if he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. Here's this other place that the word church shows up. Tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, so remains unrepentant, let him be to you, now all of a sudden, even though it was a large gathering the church, let him be to you, this you here is a singular, so most likely referring to the you that has been sinned against. Maybe it's a collective plural, but that's less likely. So, Let him be to you, the one who was sinned against, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. A Gentile and a tax collector. Now those are two expressions that we've heard used before in the Gospels, but it's a way of referring to someone who's outside of the covenant community. In other words, let him be to you as a non-believer. Treat them like you would a non-believer. Uh, don't assume that they are a believer. Don't assume that they are a Christian because Christians repent. And if someone is sternly unrepentant, you shouldn't have confidence that they are a Christian, especially when time and time again you have pleaded with them to repent of their sin, even with the entire church becoming involved, and they still refrain from repentance. Well, you should just treat them like a non believer. How do you treat non believers? Anyone? You ever guys interact with uh, non-believers before? <laughs> All right, how do you treat them? With love, gentleness, yeah. patience. You look for gospel opportunities with them. And what do they not get to do at church? Take communion. Take communion. Wow, look at you guys. Yeah, because communion is for the believing community. Yeah. Can, can they come to church? Yes. Yeah, sure. I mean, think about in, in 1 Corinthians 14. Paul's talking about when non-believers come into your, your gathering for speaking in tongues, they have no idea what's going on. Like, Paul assumes that non-believers are coming into your church gathering. So, of course they can come on Sunday, but what they can't do is experience the benefits and the privileges of being a member of the church, being a believer, which is communion and the accountability of the saints, and, and the authority of the saints. They don't get to participate in those things. So you just treat them like a non-believer. Now there's a few more, and then we'll open it up. Verse 18. Truly I say to you, and here's that expression again, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So there's that expression again. So that sense of authority, of, of entrance, and also of exclusion in the confessing community of Jesus being the Messiah, the same authority that was expressed to Peter is expressed to the church. 
It's the church that has the authority to bind on earth what has been bound in heaven and to loose on earth what has been loosed in heaven. Well, how in the world do we bind on earth what has been bound in heaven? Baptism and Baptism entrance. And Holy Baptism and, and then entrance into the church community. Where, where we affirm to each other, oh yeah, you're a fellow believer. I've heard your story. I've heard you articulate the gospel. I, I see evidence of faith in your life. I hear you repent of your sin. So that's the authority of the church. Now notice, what is the final, what is the final <clears throat> moment before the exclusion of of church membership, where all of a sudden they're treated like a non-believer. Who is it brought before? Is it brought before the elders and pastors? No, it's brought before the church. Elders and pastors exclusively do not have the authority to excommunicate someone. It is the authority of the church to do that. If it was in their authority, then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, when there's that dude who's, you know, doing some very sketchy things with his mother-in-law. Very sketchy. Things the Gentiles would never do. If the elders had authority like that, then Paul would have spoken directly to the elders and said, remove him from membership. Put him in the domain of Satan. Or Paul would have just said, he is removed from membership. But even in Paul's apostolic authority, he does not do that. He speaks to the church and he says to the church, he instructs the church, remove this person so that although they might perish in flesh, their soul might be saved. So it's the authority of the church to excommunicate someone. So how would that, that sounds Catholic. No, that sounds Christian. Well, I mean, in in Catholic, Catholicism, it is the priest who can do that alone. Okay, but yeah. this church like doesn't excommunicate somebody. What we we absolutely what, would. Okay, what give me an example. Yeah, one time uh someone sinned in a very egregious way and stole money from the church and we brought it before the entire congregation. Uh, and and our hopes was that they would repent from it and that we would walk alongside them in restoration. And and the elders did walk alongside them as they they worked hard uh, through working through their own turmoil, owning their own sin, and paying back the church for the the crimes that they committed. But it was brought before the entire church. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So uh, who who in here has undergone church discipline? Really, no one has ever talked to you about your sin. So does that mean that person couldn't come back to the church? No, of course not, because as soon as someone repents, you've gained your brother. Church discipline begins when someone confronts you about your sin. That's when church discipline begins. All of our hands should go up, and if it's not, then we are not participating in a healthy manner in the local church. People should know your sin enough and know you enough to where you regrettably sin against them. And then they should have the boldness and confidence to confront you about it. And in that moment, when you repent of your sin, you just underwent church discipline on the smallest scale. Now, unrepentant, Lord willing, it never gets to that scale where it has to be brought before the church and this person is just unrepentant. I was listening to a podcast this morning about a church up in Portland and they they went through this whole process with someone, excommunicated them from membership. And then like four years later, the person came back and and thanked the church for loving them in such a way. And there's just like a, an active, faithful member of the church now and repented of their sin. Yeah, yeah Dan? It strikes me that, right, the, the excommunication here, he's saying treat them as Gentiles or tax gatherers. Yeah. And the theme of how Jesus treats Gentiles and tax gatherers yes. has been like a focus. Like yeah. He, he loves them. He seeks them out. He's trying to bring them in where everyone else hates them. Totally, totally, right. yeah. And I mean, there is... It, and in that expression, it's not, he's not, that's not being said to the church at large, most likely, it's, but to the individual who has sinned against. So maybe it's, it's more proverbial in how the common Jewish person just thought of those people, of like almost like giving them the cold shoulder. Maybe it's permissible where they've sinned against you and they're unrepentant. You don't have, you don't have to play that uphill battle anymore. You, you can just go about your own way until that's resolved on their own end. It could be that, that also. Right? They've, they've forsaken the Jewish community. Like yeah. Jews. Like they, oh, they're not good Jews. They're not even trying to be good yeah. Jews. We don't you know, tassel them about their beard length. Yeah. We have a different set of issues. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so treat them like a tax collector and Gentile. 
uh, think through how Jesus does that in the Gospels, because that is the model for how to, to do so. Um, then there is uh, one last line in here, very common line, or last two lines, verse 19. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among you. Anyone cross-stitch that before? It's okay. No shame. Yeah, great line. Now, people usually take verse 20 to be like, as long as I got like my boy at a coffee shop, we're the church, baby. Like We're doing this thing. And that is not what this means in context at all. Uh, what in this context, where does it start with two or three people? If your brother sins. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him their fault. And she says, where two or three of you are gathered, there I am among you, in the midst of you. In other words, Jesus is intimately involved with the process of calling people out of sin and into repentance. You know how scary, I'm sure you do, how scary is it to confront someone who you love about their sin? Like when you've been wronged by them, but then also you're like, well, how will they respond if I confront them about this? That's terrifying. But you can have courage because the king of the universe is in your midst. Even when it's just you and someone else sitting at a coffee table and trying to talk about some, some sin that has taken place in your relationship. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh, the church is awesome, yeah? No? Am I convincing you enough? Okay. All right, question, questions on this. Yeah. So can we go back? Is there anything in addition to if, uh, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven? Or is that just literally a continuation of that sentence? Or is it referring to the same thing? Whatever you bind on earth? It's a continuation of the sentence, okay. yep. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the church reflects the heavenly reality. What is already true in heaven, they, the church reflects that reality. Yeah. In what they bind and in what they loose. So give me an example. Like, what would that example? Yeah, someone, someone says, I am a Christian. Well, the church then determines whether or not this person is actually a Christian and they either affirm their faith or they say, actually, you're not a Christian. Or someone is unrepentant of sin, but they're like, I'm a Christian, but they have egregious sin they don't repent of. It would be the church's responsibility through, through tears and lament to say, there is no reason that we should think you are a Christian because and you don't live that way. So we're going to remove you from membership in the and church. And therefore, you're loosed in heaven. Yeah. Got it. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. I, I just think that stuff is cool. I just want to show it to you. Okay, now turn to Matthew 22. I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to start in verse 41, very end of the chapter. So sometimes there's these passages that just like very clearly show uh, the claim of the, the New Testament authors and Jesus' own claims and how they record it that Jesus is this divine figure, that he is, he is God in the flesh. But there's also these other texts that really anchor back to um, certain Old Testament hopes, uh, specifically the one of the Messiah. And this is one of them that I think is really important. It shows up, I think, in all four Gospels, maybe just in the synoptics, but we should talk about it. Starting in verse 41. Now, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them a question, saying, What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? All right, so now we're going to hear the, the modern religious leaders of the day. Here's what they think about the Messiah, whose son the Messiah is. And they said to him, the son of David. Okay. Jesus then said to them, how is it then that David, in the spirit, under the inspiration of the spirit, as he wrote Psalm 110, how is it then that David in the spirit called him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. If then David calls him Lord, how is he his son? And no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. 
So this question silences the crowds. The religious leaders were very um, confident to call the Messiah the son of David, expecting him to come from the lineage of David. Jesus is from the lineage of David. But Jesus is also not only fulfilling these messianic prophecies, he's also doing things that only God can do. He's doing some very miraculous things, some very divine things, things that can only be done by God. And this is rubbing the Pharisees the wrong way. And they're saying, no, 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 the the Messiah is going to be the son of David. He's not going to be some, some God in the flesh person. So Jesus turns to Psalm 110 and asks them a question because they would all agree that Jesus is the son of David and they would all agree that Psalm 110 is a messianic psalm. And in that psalm, in the very first verse, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. How does that relate to David? How is it? Because David wrote this psalm. But it's, yeah. What? Yes, exactly. Who is that? Exactly. How can David say, the Lord said to my Lord? How can someone be superior to David? David is the king. There's only one who is superior to David. Yahweh. The only one that David ever calls Lord is Yahweh. So somehow David having this descendant who's going to sit on the throne other times like psalm 110 he says things like the lord yahweh said to my lord the one who is superior to me sit at my right hand and i will put your enemies under your feet so is the messiah the son of david yes but somehow the son of david will also be lord of david and David writing this, he is almost, he's recording this divine promise. This divine promise. And he's saying, the Lord said to my Lord, if the Lord is speaking to this Lord of David, then this Lord of David must exist during David's time and must be present in some way. Not something that will come into the future, but something who already is, someone who already is. So on one hand, the Messiah, yes, is the son of David. But also, according to Psalm 110, the Messiah is someone who precedes David and is superior to David. So the Pharisees of Jesus' time, like they're they're rattled because Jesus is doing Messiah stuff, but then he's also doing like divine stuff. They're saying, no, 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 no. It's going to be the son of David. And Jesus is trying to show them that their own Bible has these categories blurred together. Yes, son of David, and yes, superior Lord over David. That's who the son of David is going to be. So Jesus is showing them right here, and they cannot give an answer, nor do they ask him any more questions. This is like Jesus' gotcha moment, and it shows up in all, all the Gospels. From this point, they're just like, you know what, let's just kill him. <laughs> Yeah, that's like that's what they resolved to do. Okay, that's Matthew. It's awesome. Let me just show you a few things in Mark to set you up for success. Uh, Mark's favorite word is immediately. You'll see it all the time, immediately. Uh, Mark is the shortest gospel out of the four, Luke being the longest by a lot. Uh, Did you know that Luke wrote the majority of the New Testament when it comes to word count? He only wrote two books, Luke and Acts, but is the highest word count out of any other author of the New Testament, trumping Paul. Yeah, so Mark is the shortest, and he is driving the pace. He is trying to get you somewhere. I mean, one scene to another to another. It feels like everything that you're reading between chapters 1 and 10 happens over the course of an afternoon. Like it is so rapid and so fast-paced. Uh, but then you get to um, Mark 11. And Mark 11 begins the triumphal entry, which enters into the last week of Jesus' life. 
So Jesus' earthly ministry was about three years from his baptism to his crucifixion and resurrection. The Gospel of Mark is 16 chapters. Mark spends 10 chapters on about three years worth of material. And then he spends six chapters on one week. The word immediately shows up over 30 times in the first 10 chapters. And then it shows up like two or three times in the last six. So Mark is driving you. He is running you to the last week of Jesus. That is the focus of the book of Mark. What he wants you to see is this last week of Jesus and how he entered into Jerusalem and then was tested by the religious leaders. And then he questions them and then inevitably he is betrayed and then condemned to death. But then his tomb is empty. That's what Mark wants us to pay attention to. But the road to get there is also important. One tip for reading as you're reading, because Mark is the shortest gospel, uh, he does not waste ink. He's not looking to like fill in the details. Like, he just wants to say it as quickly as possible. But there are some stories that are way longer in Mark than they were in Matthew and in Luke. So sometimes when Mark is spending a long time on a story, you should pay attention to that because it's important to Mark to tell all those details. Like Matthew, the first verse of Mark sets us up for success in this book. So if we remember the beginning of Matthew, the beginning of Matthew is the the book of origin or the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And we're like, let's go. The promise to Abraham, the promise to David. Here we go. This one begins, the beginning of the gospel the good news of Jesus, the Messiah, the Son of God. So what does Matthew want, you, or what does Mark want you to know about Jesus? Son of God. He is the Son of God. That's what he wants you to know. Now, as you read, look for people to recognize that. Pay attention to who recognizes Jesus as the Son of God. Uh, we've read up to chapter 6, I think, today. Um, So far, there's been two figures who have called him the Son of God, and both were demons. What about people? What people are going to recognize that reality about Jesus? So the Son of God, like the Son of Man, is a title. I've already told you that it refers to the king, specifically the king from the line of David, because God will be to him a father, and he shall be to God like a son. So the Son of God is this title for a king. But also, if you were walking around in the first century and you had some coins in your pocket and you pulled one of those out, on some of them you would read, Caesar Augustus, son of God. Yeah, Caesar Augustus, son of God. The claim of the Roman Empire, the claim of Caesar Augustus, is that he is divine, that he is the son of God. It's the title for the Caesar. It is the title for the Lord of everything. Caesar. And what Mark does is he introduces his gospel and he says, this is the story of Jesus Christ, the son of God. So who's the true Lord over everything? Is it Caesar or is it Jesus? That's the compelling question that Mark invites you into. Who, whose authority will you bow down to? Whose word will you listen to? Who will you give your allegiance to? Will it be Caesar of Rome or the Lord of heaven and earth? That's what this gospel is inviting you into with that title, the Son of God. He opens up uh, with a quote from the Old Testament, and very, very rarely will Mark quote from the Old Testament. Most scholars think that the audience that Mark wrote to was a predominantly Roman audience. Uh, group, a Roman audience, uh, because of the, the lack of Old Testament quotations. Also, when things that are um, common in Jewish culture are referred to, they're explained. Like in, Matthew, or in Mark 7, I'll just turn there real, really quick. Um, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. So why, why does Mark feel like he needs to explain that hands defiled means that the hands weren't washed? Well, it's probably because that the 
predominant audience of Mark's gospel don't know that defiled hands means unwashed. So they're probably a Roman or a Gentile community. So he's writing to this predominantly Roman group, most likely, and he's telling them that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you think that would be like contentious? Mm-hmm. In the first, yeah, super contentious. That is a call of allegiance. But here is his first quote. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet. So just upload everything you remember about Isaiah. Behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Verse 2 is actually a quote from Malachi chapter 3. Verse 3 is the quote from Isaiah. So how come he doesn't say, as it is written in the prophets, Isaiah and Malachi? Why doesn't he do that? Isaiah is the first book of the latter prophets. There's three and then there's the scroll of the twelve first book of the latter prophets malachi is the last book of the latter prophets so he's he quotes from the last book and the first book and he cites isaiah kind of like a synecdoche referring to the whole canon of the latter prophets by referring to the first one jesus does this also with the the category of the writings by just referring to it as the psalms so this was a common way of referring to books of the bible but it's almost as if he's saying the entire, the entire prophets have spoken this message. Behold, I will send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. Now that quote in Malachi is referring to Elijah the prophet who will come. Okay, so God's going to send like this Elijah prophet. It's going to be the voice of one crying in the wilderness. This is uh, Isaiah 40, I believe. Isaiah 40 verse 3. A voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yahweh, make his paths straight. All right. The Old Testament hope of the restoration of Israel, of the new cosmic creation that's coming. God is going to once again send the Elijah prophet, who will then be the voice crying out in the wilderness to prepare the way of Yahweh in glory to return to his people. Yeah? Okay, then what happens? Well, John the Baptist, he was in the wilderness proclaiming a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins. And all the people were going out to him confessing their sins. Now, John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. Camel's hair and a leather belt? Who's the one other person in the Bible who wore that? Elijah. Elijah. Okay, so here is that Elijah prophet. And he's out in the wilderness and he's preaching. He's preparing the way. And who is the voice in the wilderness supposed to prepare the way for? Yahweh. God himself returning in glory to his people. In fact, even when he says in verse 8, he's like, I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Who is the one who's going to pour out the Spirit in the Old Testament? God. Now in those days... Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son. With you I am well pleased. So here's just like the way the staging of the book works. You get this quote right at the beginning. And it's calling to mind the Old Testament hope that there's going to be this Elijah figure in the wilderness who's preparing the way of Yahweh. And then you watch it play out. And it's this John the Baptist guy in the wilderness preparing the way for Jesus. You see what that puts Jesus on par with? Yahweh. That is a narrative way of presenting Jesus as Yahweh, returning in glory through the wilderness to his people. That's one of the many ways the New Testament authors are presenting Jesus as God himself. So Jesus uh, is, receives the Spirit. He, he's anointed with the Spirit as he comes up out of the water. He is driven into the wilderness where he's tempted. Much more truncated version than we have in Matthew. Here it's only two verses. And then he begins his ministry. In verse 14, now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, the good news of God. 
saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repent and believe in the good news. So the time is fulfilled. This is the culmination of time. It's Jesus is arriving into. And then he says the kingdom of God is at hand. The expression, maybe you have a footnote, like a little number in the top right corner that points you down to the bottom of your page. I have a little footnote in mine. And it says, or the kingdom of God has come near. It's the other way we could translate that. This is a really common verb that's used in the LXX, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. This is what priests would do as they would draw near to the sacrifice altar or as they would draw near to the Holy of Holies. This is what priests would do as they would draw near to the presence of God. But now Jesus is saying the kingdom of God has drawn near to you. It's not that the people are going to God's presence, but that God's presence now has come to them. And that was the hope of Isaiah 40, verse 3, is that Yahweh would return in glory to his people. So because this is the culmination of, of time and the kingdom of God is drawing near, the presence of God is coming near, the proper response is to repent and believe in the gospel. <clears throat> repent means to turn from your ways. That's what repent means. Turn from your ways. Believe means to give allegiance, to trust, to trust this news, this good news. The victorious king who's offering amnesty to the rebels, that if they would turn from their rebellion and to trust him, that they can join into the kingdom. And then his kingdom, his, uh, kingdom ministry is just off and running, and it's really fast-paced. And over and over again, Mark shows Jesus to be a better priest and a better David. It's the way he just shows over and over and over again. Uh, even when they discuss uh, Sabbath in chapter uh, 3, I think. or Yeah, in, actually in, in the end of chapter 2. They're discussing Sabbath. This is the truncated version of what we saw in in Matthew 12. They're going about, they're eating grain from uh, from the grain field. And the Pharisees say, look look what you guys are doing. This isn't lawful to be doing this on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, have you not, have you never read your Bible about, you know, David? What David did when he was in need and was hungry, he and those who were with him. How he entered the house of God in the time of Abiathar, the high priest, and ate the bread of presence which it is not lawful for any but the priest to eat, and also gave it to those who were with him. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is, e- is even Lord of the Sabbath. In Jesus' explanation of what he's doing, notice that he puts himself on par with someone. He says, remember this story? And that was okay. And so now there's this story, so it should be okay. Who is he putting himself on par with? David. David did it, and that was okay. So here I am doing it, and it's okay. And you know, David did something that only priests could do, and yet it was okay. How could David, the king, do something that only priests could do, and yet it be okay? Oh, maybe he's like a priestly king. And we see, saw tons of examples of that when we were in Samuel and when we were in Kings. We don't have time to go back to that. So this... This Davidic figure who was a king but also priestly, is on, Jesus is putting himself on par with that. Where Jesus is this priestly king figure who is on par with David. He's a better David, he's a better priest. Um, with the last six minutes of class, <coughs> classic, go to Mark uh, chapter 9. This also shows up in all... In all the synoptic gospels, the transfiguration, it's usually generally in like the end of the first third of the gospel accounts. In Luke, it's like right in the middle. It's awesome when we get there. Okay. Starting in verse, well, actually start in verse one. And he said to them, truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God after it has come with power. That sounds awesome. Now, after six days... After six days. So what day is it? Seven. The seventh day. Now on the seventh day, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. He, he changed in appearance. 
before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. For he didn't know what he was saying, and he was terrified. Understandable. And then a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. As they were coming down the mountain, and the story continues. Okay, so it's the seventh day. They're up on a mountain. A big cloud overshadows the mountain. Is this ringing any bells? Yeah, Moses, Mount Sinai, Exodus chapter 19, the the covenant presence of God descending on Mount Sinai. Like they're having a moment like that. But it says that Jesus' clothes became radiant, intensely white, like no one could bleach them. It's got it appears differently in different gospels. Like some are like, it's like lightning and Matthew, it's like the sun. Mark is like, it was like really bleached clothing. You know? I was like, good, good, Mark. But why is he emphasizing his clothing? Radiant, intensely white, like that no one could bleach? Well, who other in the Bible is there a lot of detail given to their clothing? The priests. The priests, their clothing is very important. They have very specific clothes that they wear. And then in the prophetic books, the the priests have white garments. And the priests, all the way back in Exodus 28... The high priest is, is dazzling with all of these jewels and this gold and the, the white clothing and the ephod. And the priest, the high priest, is supposed to be an earthly representation of a divine reality. How does God appear in the Old Testament? Think about Daniel 7 or Ezekiel chapter 1. White, dazzling. His hair is white. He's on fire. He's glowing. There's lightning coming. He, he is radiant. The priests were these little representations of the divine reality. So to describe Jesus not only as being transfigured, but then to talk about his clothes, Mark is emphasizing the priestly reality of Jesus. Like this is the priest, the one who all the priests were modeled after. And there'll be other ways that this is done later in the New Testament, but this is just one of those Ways And then all of a sudden, Elijah and Moses show up. Why them? What's up with them? The law and the prophets. prophets, They both represent the law and the prophets. Moses is the representative figure of the law. Elijah is the representative figure of the prophets. So they represent like the whole of scripture. And then as these two figures who represent all of scripture arrive, what do they say? about Jesus. They say, listen to him. Listen to him. And that is a quote from Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 15, which is the promise of a prophet like Moses. It's a direct quotation. In other words, here is Moses and Elijah representing all of scripture. They're saying, here is the prophet like Moses. Listen to him. You know, prophet like Moses, a guy up on a mountain who has a divine experience. Oh, You mean Jesus up on the mountain in this divine experience? So Elijah and Moses. Also, Elijah and Moses have mountaintop experiences with God Mm -hmm. in his divine presence. And then Peter, he's like, out of total fear, he's like, I'm so glad we're here. Uh, He starts hamming up. He's like, great that we're here. Uh, Let me, let's just like figure this out real quick. Uh, You know what, Jesus? How about I set up a tent for you and your boys? Does that sound good? And he's like, oh my gosh. Why would he want to set up tents? tabernacles because that's what they did in exodus the glory of the lord appears and they make tabernacles for god's glory to dwell in but this time they don't make tabernacles because he is the tabernacle. jesus is present among them he is the glory of god present and he is the prophet like moses so listen to him Matthew, Mark, and Luke all tell this story. It's always in the center between his baptism and his uh, crucifixion and resurrection. It is showcasing who Jesus is 
in the center of what Jesus accomplishes. So we're going to end there. Let me pray for us. And then we're going to go worship with the rest of our brothers and sisters and those who are are joining us this morning. Uh, Father, thank you for um, this morning and this day. God, your word is, is vast and at times unsearchable, but your word is also understandable. So God, we ask that your spirit would be giving us eyes to see and ears to hear. That although we don't understand everything fully uh, the first time around, God, we ask um, in faith that you would continue to draw us deeper into your presence and continue to give us wisdom and clarity and understanding about your word. God, teach us the ways of righteousness that you have shown us through your son, Jesus. We want to listen to him, and it is his spirit that has inspired all scripture, and that's why we read it. So God... We ask that we wouldn't get lost in the words of Scripture, but that we would always see them as Jesus said to be pointing to him and it is Jesus himself who gives life. So, so God, draw us to the foot of the cross where Jesus gives abundant life to all, all who come to him and believe. God, we love you and we need you. Pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.